guy uh, for quite a few years and uh, been amazed by the uh, quality of the products that came out. And the cameras that came out in that era were certainly among the best ones that were out there. So, uh, Mike, and I'm just going to start remembering to do this. <laughs> Okay. Well, Al, thanks for the introduction. And I guess another uh, interesting link, actually at our previous company, there are several people here today that all got to work together. So previous speaker, I actually got to, he was my manager for seven, eight years. We had a wonderful time. But anyway, that's not what we're talking about today. What I wanted to do today was look at mobile platforms in the Terra era. So one of the themes of the conference. And so here's a rough outline I'll follow. I'll give you a little bit of a kind of marketing pitch on Samsung, I guess. It's, it's marketing, but it also shows you a little bit what my context is and perspective on looking at trends in mobile. Okay, so for the trends in mobile, we'll look at a little bit of the future, some of the emerging applications that are starting to roll out now. Uh, computations, which is where Terra era really comes into play with mobiles. Some of the sensors and components making next generation applications possible. And then finally, how do these mobiles participate in an IoT world? Okay, so first about Samsung. The scale of Samsung is pretty amazing to me, you know, being pretty new in this company, but it's number one in terms of technology companies, in terms of revenue. So $216 billion last year. It's just, uh, the scale for me is still a little bit hard to comprehend. That really is uh, spread only across 10 different businesses. Quite simply, consumer electronics, where there are a few, mobile communications, and devices and solutions, really the components like Raj was talking about. For me, just to let you know, I am in this first one here, mobile communications, where we build the smartphones you see, as well as wearable devices. So quick look at some of the number one, I guess uh, product categories where Samsung is number one. You know, several things like TVs and refrigerators. I guess most relevant for today is smartphones. So, you know, the global market share of smartphones over 30%. That's a lot of smartphones. Okay, so why am I telling you about that? Well, let's think about what it takes to stay number one in mobile. How do you maintain that type of number? You know, well, thinking of the next big thing and doing it ahead of everybody else, that's one way to do it. Well, that requires spending a lot of money. In fact, about $13 billion in R&D last year and focus on innovation and technology. Okay, so I'm kind of happy that Samsung spends that much because my team spends just a little bit of that money doing R&D. And we, you know, we try to look ahead and try to figure out for what we believe is gonna be the next big thing. What types of enablers should we pull in? What types of computations are gonna be needed and things like that. So. You know, we, yeah, we execute a lot, but when we, you know, when we do our brainstorming, that's the types of things that we think of. Okay, so translating that into, you know, what, what do we believe are the big trends? I'm going to give you some of my thoughts. This isn't necessarily, you know, Samsung thoughts, but a little bit of my creative thinking and people that I work with. What, you know, what's really coming next? So if I step back and I look at all the different technologies that are going to influence what's in mobile, you know, Raj mentioned a little bit some of the other, you know, the other technologies coming in. But these are some of the kind of the global things, big things happening around us that also impact mobile. First is, you know, the increase in compute mobility. Okay, this one's pretty direct, but really being able to take your computer with you anywhere, you know, compute on the go, I think we'll see that increasing even more. Self-driving cars. So there's a lot of computations to enable a self-driving car, but once your car drives itself, that gives you a lot of time to work on the way to work, things like that. Uh, robots. You know, robots are really evolving now, and I, I think the kind of the game changer in the next few years is going to be affordable robots. And, you know, one way to look at robots, they're kind of a self-powered phone. They move <laughs> a smartphone that moves itself around. But many of the computations they can do are very similar to what you're going to have in the smartphone, especially when it comes to sensing the world and providing information back to the user. And, you know, brain control devices, uh, okay, user experience has gotten better, interfaces have gotten better, but there's still a good ways to go there. And so, you know, down the road, probably we will see brain control devices become important. 
Okay, let me get a little bit more back to today and what's going to happen in the next few years. So evolution of mobiles. Smartphones today, they're pretty useful, but they should become more useful. And in fact, instead of there being kind of a user-initiated help that they give, what will really be helpful is if they anticipate what I need and proactively provide that information to me or start a service that's going to make things, uh, I guess, give some value back to me. So they've got to really learn what I need. They've got to become personalized to me. On the wearable side, you know, smaller and smaller, but higher power is going to be important. And that, that really lets us take our computer anywhere. It's going to be, you know, like Raj was saying, you know, you can't find your smartphone. Well, if you've got your wearable bolted to you somewhere, you're probably not going to forget it. Okay, the health monitoring is going to come bigger and bigger. And, you know, finally, the Google Glass is going to really give a, you know, big help to augmented reality. Seeing things without having to actively pull your phone out. Implantables. Yeah, some people laugh, but it'll probably happen. Okay, the innovation really enabling this next big wave of applications. You know, it's easy to write software. And, well, okay, maybe software engineers won't agree. But an application created on a smartphone isn't so hard. The real trick is, you know, creating an application that requires, uh, you know, more processing power, some of the new component technologies, better sensors, things like that and the new service with it, the new application, and doing that all with a good user experience so that you, know, you can benefit from this new service without having to go to a lot of work. To up. And if it's automatic, people will use it more than one time. If you've got to work five minutes to get to something useful, you know, you'll do it one or two times and never use it again. So a historic example, or a few of them, where it was components, services, cloud, device, GPS, navigation service. So, you know, the GPS chips became affordable enough and low power enough to put on a phone. Application developers used those in an application. Cloud services came in. Maps came in. And it's tremendously useful. I mean, almost everywhere I go, where I've never been before, I have to use this. Front camera, that's another one. The service was video chat, originally, that it was developed for. Put a front-facing camera on, and, you know, I can communicate, you know, through my phone. Now. The thing we didn't know was that selfie was really probably the bigger application. But, but again, I mean, this was all about uh, the, the service that it provided, the front camera component added, processing power increasing to be able to handle it. NFC is another one. So it's a component in the phone, but it also enables banking, and there's a huge ecosystem wrapped around it and a cloud. So what, what service is next is, you know, the thing we should be thinking about, and then how do smartphones and wearables enable that? So that's a long-range question. Shorter range, we can take a look at some of the emerging applications today, and that gives us a good hint as to what's needed uh, you know, for a next step. So well, one pretty simple one is a mobile assistant. So today, you, know, you can initiate an interaction with your phone, and your phone will say, oh, how, how can I help you? What can I do? It'll do something for you. That's going to evolve, and your phone should be detecting your personal state. It should be detecting what you need, how you need it. Oh, I, I feel you have stress. You know, maybe you should relax a little bit. You know, maybe that's not just your phone, but it's also your wearables, your health monitors, and so forth. And it, it should also be able to figure out what's going on in your environment. Oh, I, I see my old friend up there. Maybe, maybe you should go say hi to him. And um, to be able to do this, actually a lot of computations, it's a lot of power aware recognition, sensors, uh, computer vision techniques, a lot of things that you really get to add to these future devices. So um, the other aspect of this is it may not just be your device, but it may be other sensors in the network and collaboration between your wearable devices and the IoT. Another one is augmented reality. It's already happening in some respects. Today there are a lot of applications you can run on a phone or a tablet, and you can get overlays of information onto you know, a, a display. But that's going to get better and better with computer vision techniques coming in and depth sensors where you can easily recognize objects, classify, and provide even better contextual information, you know, to a particular user. Another one is computational imaging. I, I think Raj probably said enough about it, but it, it's taking all the conventional stuff we used to do in image pipes and adding a lot more to them in terms of extra computations and cool things that you can do. So we already talked about focal stacks, but there's also things like high dynamic range, you know, multiple images being combined in unique ways to give, you know, really images you couldn't get out of a conventional camera. And another point, 
a lot of times it's not just about imaging. There are computer vision techniques used to figure out what data is important, what to highlight, how to highlight it. So it's really kind of a merging of a couple of different disciplines. A lot of computations required. Okay, so computations. So tera era, terabits per second, terahertz, tera ops is the, I guess the next thing that we need to talk about in terms of computing. So the, the terabits per second first. So we're a long ways from getting there on the communications network. And so a question I get a lot of times is, and with this, uh, you know, this increased bandwidth, well, why do I really need a, you know, a high computation phone or an application processor that can handle all this data? Can't I just do it all in the cloud and pipe it out to a stupid display? Well, a few years ago, I was thinking, hmm, maybe I should look at a different industry. But it turns out that hadn't been the case. In fact, the requirements on the processor have gone up and up and up, and the phones have become even more powerful. So I would argue the trend says no. Oh, the trend says yes. Well, the trend says yes that. Processing is still required, but um, big data in the cloud are nice, but the delay associated with it and the bandwidth and the latency when there are, you know, 10,000 other people at the football game using it or 100,000, you know, that, that's going to mean that mobile still has to have all that processing power. Okay, so that means teraops are needed. So a couple of the examples where teraops are needed, if you think about what we're going to do with, you know, new sensors and new vision techniques. Um, computer vision, machine learning, it takes a lot of computations. Right now, you can go to the cloud and do that if you have the service there and you have the availability and you can accept the latency. Um, deep learning convolutional networks, these are great techniques, very high computational power required, and they're outperforming you know, conventional recognition technology by a wide margin. So it's well worth it to implement these very complex things on a handset. The conventional approach, crank up the clock, crank up the frequency, and just you know, run as fast as we can. So can we get to a terahertz clock? Well, not really, not anytime soon. So this is a plot of desktop CPU, and you'll see over the years it's gone up and up and up. So it's on a log scale, so it's going up and up. And then just a few years ago, about 10 years ago exactly, 20, 2004, kind of flattened out. It's a little bit alarming. So if we look at the trend of that, I mean, it, it really, really got flat. And I, I don't see it going any higher anytime real soon. Now, what does it look like for mobile? Okay, so I overlaid this on some devices I worked with in the past. So the first five are actually the OMAP, one, two, three, four, five, that you know, Raj and I worked on several of those together. And uh, this last one is a current chip that we're working with. And I, you know, I'm not exactly sure, but it looks like we're just about to hit that stopping point where we're going to be innovative in other dimensions than clock. So there, there's more to it than just frequency, though. So th this is a chart that I borrowed. And so this is the um, you know, Moore's law here, number of transistors going up. This is you know, the clock frequency that's just maxed out. But the power, let's look at as well. So power for desktop maxed out at about 100 watts. On a handset, if you run at 100 watts, guess what? It's going to burn your face. So the practical average power limit for a handset is about three watts. So we've got to do all this with very reduced power. Uh, there's another thing that's not on this chart, which is the number of cores going up over time. And so now we're at you know, four, eight, 16 cores and so forth, not just in desktop, but also mobile. So the question is, how do we get to tera ops? Well, it's not going to happen by tera hertz. So to, to get to really address the need for all these applications, we're going to have to go wide, we're going to have to go parallel, and we're going to have to go dedicated processing. So to get to teraops per, tera ops per second, we have to jointly optimize across several different dimensions. Performance is one, use cases demand it. Power efficiency, energy efficiency, they're almost the same, but not quite. Okay, power efficiency matters because of that three watt limit and thermal, you know, kind of a thermal limit. You may have to throttle your, your processing power. Energy efficiency is a lot more about, you know, living on a battery for all day. And I, I can tell you, if we were running Terra Ops on the main CPU, you know, you're going to be using it for 30 minutes, and then you're going to be plugging in. That's not what we want to have. All this, you've got to do with cost considerations in mind, so your operations per square millimeter on your die. Because if you don't do that well enough, then a competitor is going to come in and figure it out. So you've got to have really the right trade-offs to get processing power, flexibility, and so forth. So let's look at an example. 
Um, to get to Terra Ops, one way to do it is use multi-core devices, multi-core CPU, GPU, DSP. Also have some of the dedicated functions in hardware. And then with each one of these cores, we'll probably want to use you know, different tricks like very large instruction words, parallel processing, and then we need con concurrent computing across all of these cores on a chip to be able to you know, really uh, do a wide variety of things and meet the use case needs. So, but be careful here. You might think, well, let's just put everything in hardware accelerator and we'll fit in the lowest power. But that doesn't exactly work because those are very dedicated operations. Some of the brilliance in creating chips is figuring out what should be in hardware and what shouldn't be. Thinking ahead three years ahead of time for how we're going to allocate the different processing and compute requirements across the cores. So I took an example here from, from cores published over the last three or four years for CPU, GPU, DSP, and hardware accelerator. And if I look at the number of operations provided by those devices, it's about 40 in the CPU today. Some of them are faster today, but the ones I looked at in the published ISSCC conference were 40. 125 for GPU. This particular DSP was pretty low powered because it was kind of a super low power audio playback, but the point is it's not tremendously higher than anything else. In some cases, it's lower. Hardware accelerator, and this was for actually an object recognition and tracker for a drone, it was 270, you know, 270 giga ops. So you, you sum that up and it's about 443 giga operations per second. So these are state-of-the-art devices, you know, published in the last couple of years. Projecting ahead, looking at, you know, to, you know, it may already be built. In some cases, it's going to be in a product in the next couple of years. CPU is easily pushed to, you know, 200 giga ops or giga instructions per second. GPU is 400. You know, we're seeing more par parallelism, more power. And DSP, you know, it can easily stretch to 100 and still have better energy efficiency than either of those two. And hardware, once we know the function, it can be really kind of dedicated purpose, you know, very high processing capability. So you add all these together and you get to 1.5 tera ops. This is actually 1,500 gig ops. So we've already broken the tera op barrier for what's needed. Okay, there's another, kind of another way to look at it, and this compares a number of different chips over the last five years in different categories, CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, and the dedicated hardware. So, so really the message here is, you know, we got a 1,000x increase in, you know, CPU to dedicated processing, and that's going to really let us, you know, live within that 3-watt power limit and, you know, also live on a battery all day. But you got to choose it carefully because you can't overbloat your chip and, you know, blow out the cost structure of it. Our, you know, you're not going to be competitive versus the uh, smaller die versions. Okay, so sensors and components. A couple of words on, you know, what's coming in mobiles. Well, the mobile, you know, we've concluded, needs to analyze. It needs to recognize things going on around it. And it should be able to do that so your phone can know when you're in a, let's say, a social situation. And it needs to guide you to do something, you know, say hello to a friend. Also, to better sense reality, we need things like depth sensors. So, you, you know, you can figure out who's around you, what's around you. So really the who, what, where, depth sensors are going to enable this. Collaboration with IoT sensors are going to enable this. And a lot of processing power. So smartphones collaborating is, is not just going to, you know, give more analysis capability of what's going on, but also uh, combining those between multiple smartphones and crowdsourcing that sense data, you know, that's going to give new capabilities that even, you know, a single user with his device and his wearable won't be able to do. Quick word on displays. Flexible displays are so cool. I don't know if you've seen them, but about three years ago, Samsung demonstrated at CES for the first time. And, you know, it's unbelievable. You bend the display and it still works. So in our case, it's because they're OLED displays, you know, the organic pixels where, you know, everything's almost self-sufficient around the pixel, so it's not spread out. That's really going to create, you know, all sorts of new devices. Um, one that I in intended to put in here is the new Note 4 device. It's got a curved edge on it, and that curved edge adds new capability. You know, you can keep an all-day stock scanner running or something like that. Uh, it's not just that, but other things like uh, the transparent OLEDs, you know, they're going to enable things like new glasses for AR. And so what I really want my Google Glass to look like, you know, something like this, where I can put it on and it doesn't, you know, I don't have anything hanging off of it 
and I see through, and then I can augment on top of it, you know, oh, here, here's Al sitting right here, and I don't have to, you know, pull my phone up to do anything. So that's coming. I don't think it's going to be in the next couple of years, but it'll happen. And there may also be some new capabilities in terms of glasses interacting with smartphones. So it's pretty hard today to get a great, you know, 3D display, and it's a long ways from holographic display. But if you combine it with glasses that are, you know, controllable on both sides, you, you can add 3D objects on top of it. A lot of processing required to do that, a lot of computer vision techniques. So last, for the IoT world, how does this relate? What do wearables and smart, you know, smartphones have to do with it? Okay, so first off, you know, the simplest things, the simplest way for me to describe IoT is it's comprehending sensors, objects, systems, and people. And the interaction between the IoT and humans are this. The sensors observe things going on. They inform the system, give notifications, and then based on that, somewhere in the system there's an alert back to the, back to the person so a service can be provided. Now, how does that happen with a human? Well, you know, how does a human know what's going on in the IoT? A couple of ways. If you have an internet appliance like a refrigerator, well, it's tied to the internet, and you can find out, you know, what maybe where eggs are on sale or something like that. Uh, if you have a robot, well, it can talk to you. You can talk to it. If you have a car, you know, you can touch the screen. You can control the knobs. And maybe it makes some noise back, but that's not very personal at all. When you're out and about roaming, how do you talk to the IoT? it's going to be smartphones and wearables. So the collaboration between the devices you have with you and what's on the network, extremely important. It really gives you that personal connection. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so the key thing in mobiles are the sensing. So new sensors, new components, identification and recognition. So for this, there's a teraops, a processing power, computer vision techniques, and this really is going to push the boundary and push us into TerraOps required. And then, you know, this provides back to us, it's the interface to the cloud, so you can really touch the cloud using these devices. Okay, so another way to look at it is the IoT is very dense, not, sorry, it's very sparse, and it's very wide. For example, in this room, you could have IoT sensors and you could count the number of people in here. Okay, but you probably couldn't say, you know, well, this is how. You know, probably it counts you as a person. But if I have a, you know, a very capable device and a wearable with computer vision techniques, I, I can actually very densely look at you. And I can, uh, you know, with a lot of computations, I can recognize you, recognize, you know, who you are and what you are. I can recognize things around you. Um, the, the IoT may not provide that, but the devices are going to have a lot of processing power and capability to do that. So I, I see they're complementary in that way. So I think for cloud, right, the cloud's exploding, the IoT is expanding. So that's all great news for personal devices. It doesn't replace personal devices at all. I think they'll go hand in hand having, you know, continued growth. Okay, so in summary, the, the TerraOps required for mobile, I mean, that comes from these emerging applications, new things like, you know, computer vision, and it's going to be, you know, accomplished on a handset by heterogeneous processing, CPUs, DSPs, GPUs, and dedicated hardware in the right areas. There will be new sensors, new components, and this will allow us to better sense the environment but also collaborate with the IoT. There will be new game changer applications, and you know, my, when I try to be creative, I try to think, man, what can I do that's really hard? You know, and software application isn't it. It's, you know, new components, new technologies, a service you don't have today, some capability that, you know, we, we should be able to provide to users in a few years. And combining all these things together, that really makes a killer app. And then finally, uh, you know, will mobiles remain important? You know, absolutely. It's really the personal touch, you know, us touching the IoT. So thank you, everybody. So I'll take care. Maybe a microphone. Uh, questions? We have time for a couple. Yes, I had a question around uh, the portable mobility of your devices are getting smaller and smaller. The compute plat platforms are getting, you know, more and uh, higher powered and more capacity. 
What are you guys doing to work on the area of making these smaller devices more productive in terms of protected I.O. and those kind of things so that we can actually enable these devices to be productive devices in the future? Yeah, so, so a lot of that is the software to be able to, you know, give developers the hooks to do different things with them. And I guess things like the, uh, you know, the software design kits, SDKs, um, there are also collaborations like the uh, developer conferences where, you know, customers are allowed to come in and present their needs, uh, a little bit of, you know, interaction and workshop. So the, the, our ears are out, we, you know, we're listening. You know, I, I may not be personally, but, you know, there's a huge developer network and, you know, we really do try to, you know, figure out how to enable developers and IoT system providers and things like that. I'm not sure if that is really what you were asking. Oh, maybe. I know, uh, I, I couldn't help but notice the implantables. Uh, uh, Brain-machine brain interface, basically, right? Yeah. That's been kind of on my mind recently for other uh, yeah. I, I think that... really serious about that? I'm sorry. I think the question's around, you know, that we have these computers today that are 10 pounds or 5 pounds, right? When's the yeah. point at which we can leave the computer behind and just use our mobile device to do the productivity portion? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 so I'll get to you in a minute. Yeah, yeah. I've got this Note 3 device, and this thing is just great. Oh, you got one too. So it's it's almost there. So let, let me uh, well let me not throw my old uh, <laughs> my old smartphone manufacturer under the bus completely. But after I moved to this device, I stopped carrying my tablet. Okay, I still have to carry my laptop sometimes because if I want to edit and things like that, I, I need it. But the Note 3 is part way there. The, the there's still some limitations, you know, no keyboard and things like that. But it's, it's a good step on the way there. Um, for brain-controlled interfaces, I, okay, right now it looks kind of dorky. The, I don't know if you noticed the picture with the guy with the electrodes. I've seen several things, resistive contacts on your head, you know, around your brain. And you can do yes, no decisions, and it'll interpret it. And the way you do it, it it's, okay, use, user experience is horrible. But basically, if I want to... If I want to do a sequence of binary decisions to translate into, let's say, a letter, I can do that. And I basically think, make my brain active, don't think, don't think. Make my brain active, you know, one's a one, one's a zero, and you can go back and forth between those. And it actually works, but it's not very fast. <laughs> Are you guys serious about that? I well, to be honest, I don't know anybody at Samsung working on it, but <laughs> that, that's not to say that people aren't working on it. But, <laughs> but I, I think it will at some point, you know, be used. Um, maybe it's when you get mobile MRIs where <laughs> you can do much better. Okay, I think we better uh, get rolling. Thank you. So uh, we'll have the poster session out. First of all, I'm very happy to see us. That we filled up. I knew Raj's energy would draw people in from out there. Um, so yeah, please do. We have just a half hour for the poster session. So take off. Please uh, go grill those students. And we'll be back here sharp at 1040.